All right, go ahead and open your Bibles, if you would, to Revelation chapter 18. Revelation chapter number 18. As we consider, continue our study, we had the religious Babylon this last week. This week we have the political Babylon destroyed. All right. I'll begin reading with verse number one. And after these things, I saw another angel come down from heaven, having great power, and the earth was lightened with his glory. And he cried mightily with a strong voice, saying, Babylon the great is fallen, is fallen, is become the habitation of devils and the hold of every foul spirit and a cage of every unclean and hateful bird. For all nations have drunk of the wine of her wrath, of her fornication, and the kings of the earth have committed fornication with her, and the merchants of the earth are wax rich through the abundance of her delicacies. And I heard another voice from heaven saying, Come out of her, my people, that ye be not partakers of her sins, that you receive not of her plagues. For her sins have reached unto heaven, and God hath remembered her iniquities. Uh, let's go ahead and stop there, and uh, then we'll pick up as we go on through the chapter. Heavenly Father, now we would ask you to add your blessing to the reading and to the study of your word tonight, and we give you thanks in Jesus' name. Amen. Please be seated. As I said, last week we looked at religious Babylon. Tonight we look at the economic system, the world system uh, of Babylon that is destroyed. Now, let me just throw this in here quickly and then uh, uh, we won't have to deal with that much more. Is Babylon... A city, is that actually the name of the city? I want to give you several theories. If you read uh, a lot of places, you can get all kinds of ideas. Uh, one of them was, uh, particularly when Saddam was in control, that he was going to rebuild Babylon, and that would be the center, the economic center of the world. Probably not so, wouldn't you agree at this point? Will the place be called Babylon, or is that a identification of the system that's there? I believe it's identification. I do not know what city it could be. I've heard Rome would be one, New York City. Some people have done that because of the uh, economic center that is there. It really doesn't matter. There is a center that is going to be in charge under the Antichrist, of all economics and God is going to destroy that system and it may not even be a city it may just be the system that we're, we're talking about but when we look at begin to look at this chapter we're going to find that Babylon falls the earth weeps and heaven rejoices over what is taking place now, Babylon is still the subject in this chapter uh, and through the, this whole chapter. It is not the beast anymore. It is not the ten kings that are, are mentioned before that we've talked about in other chapters. It's not those things now. It's this system that is going to be destroyed. It's given over entirely to the description of the destruction of, and we'll use the term Babylon because that's what it uses. And so we have this happening. Okay. I get all my technical experts up here. We will go somewhere. He's so smart. <laughs> yeah. 
Anyway, we have another angel, the scripture says, that comes. It's not one of the angels that we've looked at previously. This one seems to be different than the ones that we've met before in this chapter or anywhere else in the Bible. It introduces a new one or another angel. Now, one thing we know about angels, they are not all identical, at least in their work for the Lord. They may be different in other ways also. For example, the Bible says that this one comes on the scene and uh, uh, his glory lightens the world. It brings light to some places. I've not seen any other angel in the scripture described that way. Some angels have names and are given in the scripture. Some have positions, Michael the archangel, for example, in the scripture. But this seems to be an angel that's distinguished or different from the others. But regardless, all angels are mighty angels with power given to them by God. So this one comes on the scene and look at verse two and verse three. And we see the announcement that he makes. And he cried mightily with a strong voice saying, Babylon, the great has fallen, is fallen and has become the habitation of devils and the hold of every foul spirit and a cage of every unclean and hateful bird. For all nations have drunk of the wine of her, of the, the wine of the wrath of her fornication and the kings of the earth have committed fornication with her and the merchants of the earth are wax rich through the abundance of her delicacies. So when this angel comes on the scene, he describes some things. Uh, that uh, Babylon is fallen. He's beginning to describe the destruction of this political, economical uh, identity that controls the world. Now, this warning is not new. If you go back to chapter 14 and verse 8, that warning was given way back there. And so now we're getting to the place where it's about to happen, and so the announcement is, is emphasized once again. And this commercial system will go the way of the religious system that we talked about last week. It will be gone. Government... Businesses will be at that time obsessed with greed. Kind of sounds like it is today, doesn't it? But they'll be obsessed with greed and uh, in control of things. Remember, we've talked about the mark of the beast and you can't buy or sell without those things. And so there is a system where the Antichrist controls who gets wealthy and who doesn't, who's in control and who isn't. And so uh, they will suck up all the world's wealth if possible. And uh, if we look at what we've looked at before, all the calamities that have come onto the planet, wealth, material things, are going to have to be very, very important during that time. And so there's an uh, alarm sounded, uh, uh, an alarm to flee. Look at verse 4. And I heard another voice from heaven saying, Come out of her, my people, and be ye not partakers of her sins, that ye receive not of her plagues. Here is the warning. Those who have not yet surrendered to the Antichrist. There may be some that have already been saved and are still hiding, not yet beheaded or not yet killed. But God gives a warning. Don't get messed up with her. 
no matter what you do. Come out from among her. You know, think about this for a moment. There's a lot of problems on this planet, but God still cares about his people. He still cares about those of us who are born again. And during that tribulation period, he is still going to care for those that he loves, those that are close to him. And he, he tells them to come out and be separate. Now, we're told something like that in the New Testament, Testament, aren't we? Come out from among them and be ye separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing. We're told uh, those kind of things. We're warned that way. Well, why does God warn us and why does God warn them to separate, to come out from among them and be separate? Well, there's two reasons. Uh, obviously, there's. I guess we can uh, uh, probably come up with several if we wanted to, to play with that for a moment. But uh, the first one is to remain holy, to remain consecrated to the Lord. Because when we get entangled with the world, it always destroys that which is good, that which God wants us to have. The second is for our protection. When God says, come out from among them and be you separate, whether it's here or for us today, he is basically saying, there's some bad things that are going to happen if you get involved with that, if that becomes your attitude, if the world becomes that which controls you, if the things of this world are what's most important to you, bad things are going to happen. And they always do. You build your life on wealth and wealth can be lost. We're going to see that in just a moment. You build your life on uh, uh, talent and you can lose talent. You see, what, what is important is it what's in here and that relationship you have with God. So God asks us to come out because he cares for us, because he wants to protect us, and he knows what would happen if we don't. And then we see an accumulation of sins beginning with verse number 5. For her sins have reached unto heaven, and God hath remembered her iniquities. Reward her even as she rewarded you, and double unto her, double according to her works, in the cup which she hath filled, uh, fill her double. How much she hath glorified herself and lived deliciously, so much torment and sorrow give her. For she saith in her heart, I sit a queen, and am no widow, and shall see no sorrow. First thing we see is her sins have reached heaven. Now, you and I understand that God always knows what's going on. It's no surprise. But it's a term that has been used in, in uh, uh, other places in the scripture. For example, when Israel was in bondage to Egypt, the cries uh, of the Israelites reached heaven and God began to do something. In his time, God does the work that he needs to do. But as this world gets worse and worse and this system gets worse all the time, then God says, that's enough. I've heard enough. Time to move. Time to do something. Her sins, uh, has, she's been adding sin to sin, piling them up. If you remember in the Old Testament, God stopped Babel by confusing the language. But he is going to stop this in a different way. And this is why I, I believe that there is a sinner that we would call Babylon. Verse 8, therefore her plagues come in one day, death and mourning and famine, and she shall be utterly burned with fire, for strong is the Lord God who judgeth her. So he's going to judge her, and in one day 
it's all going to be gone. Think about that for a moment. In one day, and according to verse 6, she's going to reap what she sows, but she's going to reap double. Think about it for a moment. How many of you plant a garden? Okay. And you plant a seed, right? Say green beans. Do you get one green bean from that seed? No, you get, if you've done anything right, you get a lot of green beans from that one little seed that you plant. You see, we reap what we sow, but we always reap more than that which we sow. And so God says to the, about them, it's going to be a double judgment. And God's going to judge this system for several reasons. Look in verse 7, we see them. It says, she hath glorified herself and lived deliciously. First of all, pride. She has glorified herself. She thinks that she is the end of all. Now think about it for a moment. We went through those last week, so we're not going to do that. But every great power has gone to rubbles. They looked like they would never fall. The Roman Empire looked like that. America is probably the greatest nation upon this earth. But that doesn't mean that they're going to last forever. Doesn't mean that judgment might not come. And so we need to be realize that when we become prideful, it becomes a sin, a problem. And then, then the scripture says in that verse that we just read that she lived deliciously. A self gratification. It was all about this system. Now, I think you and I can understand that there are a lot of movers and shakers in this world, and most of them are really not concerned about you. Did you ever watch an ad on TV for anything? What's the purpose of the ad? To separate you from your money. It's really what it boils down to to get you to purchase whatever it is that they're trying to advertise. And so what they want is your money. And uh, that's not a bad thing. Uh, the fact is, you know, if you make a product, you ought to make some money off of it. You ought to be able to sell it. If you do the work, you ought to get some income from it. But this is not the kind of thing that you and I would see natural. Because we, we've got to go back and remember that you cannot buy or sell without the mark of the beast. And so it is funneled into the hands of a few at this time. And then uh, she's presumptuous also. She says, I'm a queen and will see no sorrow. The system thinks of the end of everything. No one can hurt me. No one can destroy me. Nothing can take away my great power. Well, we're going to see that she's going to grieve uh, and very, very quickly. Then in verse 8, we, we begin to see annihilation's swiftness. Therefore shall her plagues come in one day, death and mourning and famine, and she shall be utterly burned with fire, for strong is the Lord who judgeth her. Since fire is mentioned, is it possible that it's a bomb? I don't know. Does God need a bomb to destroy him? I don't think so. But God has used men, and he's used the systems of this world before. So it could be a nu nuclear device, but I, I see that it's going to be very swift, and we see who's going to mourn. Uh, three groups of people are going to mourn over destruction. 
and uh, uh, the first are the monarchs in verse 9 and 10. Uh, they're going to mourn uh, the leaders of the kings of this earth because they've committed fornication and lived deliciously with her and will bewail her and lament for her when they shall see the smoke of her burning, standing afar off for the fear of her torment, saying, Alas, alas, that great city Babylon, that mighty city, for in one hour is thy judgment come. So this group, uh, under the control of the Antichrist, have had some great power and some great wealth, but now it's gone. And so they stand back and they say, I've lost it all. Back in the Great Depression, people killed themselves because they lost everything. But here are the kings of the earth, the, the, those who seem to be in control. They are going to stand back and wail and weep because of that. Well, look at verse 11. And then we see the next group, the merchants. And the merchants of the earth shall weep and mourn over her, for no man buyeth their merchandise anymore. The merchandise of gold and silver and precious stones and of pearls and fine linen and purple and silk and scarlet and uh, thine wood and all matter of vessels of ivory and all matter of vessels of the most precious wood and of brass and iron and marble and cinnamon and odors uh, and ointments and frankincense and wine and oil and fine flour and wheat and beast and sheep and horses and chariots and slaves and souls of men. Now, as we look at that one, uh, well, let's, let's read two more verses. And the fruits uh, that they uh, that I so lusted after are, are departed from thee, and all things which were dainty and goodly are departed from thee, and thou shalt find them no more at all. The merchants of these things which were made rich by her shall stand afar off, for fear of her torment, weeping and wailing. And so now we have the merchants. And their problem is this economic political system gave them the authority, gave them the vehicle by which they could sell. And now, because it has collapsed, it's fallen apart, they have no vehicle. And no system because we got away from money and we got away from buying things uh, we, with the mark of the beast. And so they have no money. Their best customer base has gone and they stand back and they weep and wail. So now we have the kings of the earth going to pieces. We have the merchants of the earth going to pieces at this time. Uh, and so they, they mourn. Uh, again, there won't be anyone to buy any of the things that they would have to sell. And then verse 17 says, for in one hour, so great riches is come to naught. And every shipmaster and all the company and ships and sailors and as many as trade by sea stood afar off. And they cried when they saw the smoke of her burning, saying, What city is like unto this great city? And they cast dust on their heads and cried, weeping and wailing, saying, Alas, alas, that great city wherein we were made rich, and all that had ships in the sea by reason of her costliness, for in one hour she is made desolate. And so the maritime masters mourn. We may be talking more than just sea. The great mode of transportation for most goods was the sea in biblical days. So it might be the trucking, it might be the railroads along with this, but the idea here is nothing to ship, nothing to, to move around. Since the merchants have no way to sell, we have nothing to ship. You see, the biblical truth, when you live for money and you live for happiness, they can be taken away. 
because your happiness, if it's based on economics, is not inward, it's outward. If your peace, if your joy, if your happiness is inward, no matter what happens, they can't take it away. So if money is your God and then it's gone, there's a godless grief when it's gone. You have a sorrow that's there. Now, as we think about this, we found that the destruction is one day, several times it's mentioned in one hour. That's pretty swift. It may be a surprise to many and will be. But notice what God says now in verse 20. Rejoice over her, thou heaven, and ye holy apostles and prophets, for God hath avenged you on her. God encourages heaven to rejoice because he's making things right. He's judged the system that martyred them during the tribulation. Now think about it for a moment. If you remember, way back in chapter 6, there are those who had been slain. And uh, here's what they said. And it says, and they cried with a loud voice saying, How long, O Lord, uh, holy and true, dost thou not judge and avenge our blood on them that dwell on the earth? And in verse 11 it says, And white robes were given to every one of them, and it was said unto them that they should rest yet for a little season until their fellow servants also and their brethren uh, that should be killed as they were should be fulfilled. Now God says that season is over. It's time for you to start rejoicing. I've done what you've asked that, that would be done. And so heaven is now told to rejoice. And the abruption is thorough. Look down to verse 22. And the voice of the harpers and magi magicians and of the pipers and trumpeters shall be heard no more at all in thee. No craftsman of whatsoever craft shall be, uh, craft he be, shall be found any more in thee. And the sound of the millstone shall be heard no more in thee. And the light of a candle shall shine no more at all in thee. And the voice of the bridegroom and of the bride shall be heard no more at all in thee. For thy merchants were the great men of the earth for by sorceries were all nations deceived. By thy sorceries were all nations deceived. And in her was found the blood of the prophets and of the saints and of all that were slain upon the earth. So the millstone is not going to be heard anymore, going to be cast into the sea in verse 21. Uh, uh, it's no longer useful. A millstone, by the way, was about four to five feet in di diameter and about a foot thick. And uh, this stone is symbolic for the sudden violent destruction of Babylon. But it's thorough. Notice here the things that are not going to be heard in her anymore. The things that used to be done are not going to be done anymore. There's no nothing left uh, as you read through here that brings happiness joy it's all sadness now it's all sorrow uh, not even any weddings brides and grooms uh, to, to come along no musicians uh, musicians to sing uh, no instruments are going to be played nothing but sorrow and sadness but there's one little thing in the end of verse 23 and says, Thy merchants were the great men of the earth, for by thy sorceries were all nations deceived. The word sorceries comes from a Greek word, uh, pharmakia, uh, and the English word is pharmacy that we have. And it carries the meaning of magic, occult, and drugs. Think about that for a moment. 
it already is illegally, but now they're trying to legalize some of it. Uh, that could be a great money source for these people. But the Bible says they were deceived by these things. You know, you get people on drugs, they don't think very straight, do they? They don't act very smart sometimes. The reality is it may be that one of the big things that are, are going to be prevalent during this period of time is the sale of drugs because it keeps people under control. You get somebody hooked on drugs, you know why we have so much crime now, don't you? To get drug money. You get them hooked and they got to keep coming back. You, you've got a good source of repeat customers. When they run out of money, they'll get your money. That's the way it works. So it may be a huge source of income during this time, but it's also that which was used to deceive the people into following this false uh, religious system that was destroyed last week that we talked about, the economic uh, system that we're destroying this week, the political system uh, uh, along with that. And so as we come to the end of this chapter, we see that all the bad is not going to win. God is still on the throne. And next week, we begin to look at some good things, some positive things that are take, taking place, particularly in heaven. Married Supper of the Lamb being one of those. What's it going to be like? I don't know. But I'll tell you, we've waited a long time for it. I don't think it's going to be a hamburger. I think we're going to have a good time with the Lord, don't you? I don't think it's going to be fast food. I think it's going to be a time of celebration there in that time. But we'll get into that next week. Let's go ahead and stand and be dismissed in prayer. As the Lord speaks to your heart tonight, maybe you would be moved to pray that we can do some things to reach those around us, that we can make a difference in this world, that we can make a difference in this city. For these things that we are talked about are going to come to pass. If you're saved, you're prepared. But what about those around you? Saturday saturation is a good place to start. Why not commit yourself now to begin to do what you can to make a difference in our families, in our city, and with the missions conference in the world. We can serve the Lord with gladness in all those places if we so desire. Heavenly Father, now we dismiss uh, with invitation him and with prayer and ask that you would bless. Speak to our hearts. Help us to see that the time is short. As we glance at some of the things that are going to take place, we already see the beginnings of them, so the time must be short. Help us to live like that, to work while it is yet day, because the night comes when no one can work. We ask that you would bless this invitation time, and we give you thanks in Jesus' name. Amen. Page 376, I have decided to follow Jesus. So we sing that together. God speaks to your heart. Here's a place to pray, a time to come to the Lord. I have decided to follow Jesus. Page 376. so much for being with us tonight. Be in prayer again for uh, our missionaries, the Jerkbergs, and for uh, Daniel Hurd as they travel 
uh, down for the, the funeral and uh, be in prayer for Saturday saturation. And we appreciate so much. Let's be dismissed in prayer. Brother Billy Johnson dismisses, if you would.